Namaste. So today's sutra, actually five sutras or verses, shlokams, from the Srimad Bhagavatam, also known as Bhagavata Purana. In these excerpts, Narada Muni, the sage among the demigods, the son of Lord Brahma, explains to Vyasadeva how he became enlightened. And this is very interesting. There's so much in these verses, and uh, we'll try to explain as best we can after we recite the Sanskrit. Aham purati tabhave bhavam mune dasyas tu kasyas chana veda vadinam nirupito balaka eva yoginam shushrushane pavrishi nirvivikshatam. O Muni, in the last yuga I was born as the son of a certain maidservant engaged in the service of brahmanas who were following the principles of Vedanta. When they were living together during the four months of the rainy season, I was engaged in their personal service. Te maya petakila chapabhake Dhanante dhritata kridana ke nuvartini Chakru kripam yadyapi tulya darshana Sushru shamane munayolpa basini Although they were impartial by nature, those Vedantins blessed me with their causeless mercy. As far as I was concerned, I was self-controlled and had no attachment for sports, even though I was a boy. In addition, I was not naughty, and I did not speak more than required. Uchishtalepan anumodita vijayi sakritsma bhunje tadapasta kilbisa evam pavritasya vishuddha chetasas Tadharma evat maruchi parayate. Once only, by their permission, I took the remnants of their food, and by so doing, all my sins were at once eradicated. Thus I became purified in heart, and at that time, the very nature of the transcendentalist became attractive to me. Tatran vahang krishna katha pragayatam anugrahe na shrina vangmanhara tashradhaya me nupadam vishrimbata priyashravasyanga mamabhavadruchi. O Vyasadeva, in that association, and by the mercy of those great Vedantins, I heard them describe the attractive activities of Lord Krishna, and thus listening attentively, intense love arose for him whose glory is loving. Tasmings tadalab taru cher mahamate Priyashravasya sakalita marirmama Yayai hame tat sada sattva mayaya Pashye mai brahmani kalpitam pare O great sage, thus arose in me who had gained a passionate longing for him, the glory of love the unshaken conviction that this universe, appearing as both real and unreal, is created by my own elusive power, and I am, in reality, the Supreme Brahman. 
So there's so much in these verses. <laughs> it's a mini course in transcendentalism all by itself. I'm using mostly the translation of my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, except for the last verse, and I'll explain why when we get there. But meanwhile, it's very interesting and informative and helpful to notice that from the beginning, Narada says he was a servant. He was born in the position of servitude. His mother was a maidservant, maybe of a king, he doesn't say, or some other rich or powerful person. And that means that he was likely the son of this maidservant's master. But because he was not the son of a wife, he had no royal or otherwise uh, prerogatives uh, that would accrue to the legitimate son of such a person. He was, in other words, kind of a cast off, kind of a neglected person, son of a maidservant. He doesn't mention his father at all. So in this position, all he could do, I mean, really, the only freedom he had was to serve nicely. And by good fortune, he got to serve some Vedantists. Actually, the term used is Vedavadis, Vedavadinam, a, a group or uh, a number of Vedantists. Uh, and the interesting thing about Vedanta, of course, is that in its original meaning, it refers to Brahman as the supreme, as the absolute from which everything has come. So they were reciting this same uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, or at least materials that are or form the basis of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which are pastimes of Krishna. Because he says in the next verse that the Vedantins blessed him. How did they bless him? By giving him their association. Now, association is very powerful. We tend to become like the persons we associate with. So one should be very cautious, really, how we associate and whom we associate with because association is such a powerful influence. We actually pick up the tastes and the activities of the people we closely associate with. By good fortune, Narada, in his previous birth, got to associate with these enlightened Vedantins and hear them reciting the scriptures. So he was a good boy. He was a sober child. I was like that too. I didn't have much use for toys and for uh, sports and other kind of meaningless pastimes of childhood. I was studious. I liked to read a lot and I read very widely. So I can imagine how he was. He was quiet and sober, thoughtful young fellow. And then the next verse, something very important is revealed. That he took the remnants of the food of these advanced devotees. And by that influence, he was released from all sins. We all come into this life with karma from our previous lives. And because of that, there may be inauspicious um, astrological configurations in our birth chart. But if we come into the association of enlightened beings, and especially if we serve them and take their remnants, this is called prasad, meaning mercy. If by their mercy we get to take their remnants, notice he says, with their permission, it's not like he was taking their plates into the kitchen and gobbling. 
<laughs> but by their permission, he took the remnants. You see, all intimate relationships should be based on agreement and permission. We should never transgress the trust that people put into us by acting outside of the agreements that we make uh, or negotiate or get somehow from them. And so Narada here uh, displays tremendous integrity by only taking these remnants of their food, of the Vaishnavas or of the yogis, with their permission. This is a very important point. In relationships, sometimes we see people uh, going outside the relationship and doing something they know their partner wouldn't like, but uh, they do it secretly. Uh, this is a lack of integrity. If there is real agreement between people in a relationship, it means that they have discussed what is and is not acceptable to both of them, and especially what would be a deal breaker, uh, what would end the relationship. And that even if they have the opportunity and a desire, they don't do those things that would lead to their partners becoming upset. Or rather, they negotiate the permissions that they feel they need to maintain their own self-integrity. This is a deep topic, but it's touched on here because really uh, spiritual life and association with advanced transcendentalists is dependent on their permission. And if we transgress their permission, we create offenses. And the offenses can react very severely and stop all our progress in spiritual life. I've seen this again and again in my own life, that people who offended me, even though they felt very justified and righteous in doing it, it stopped all their spiritual progress. And they remained stuck right where they were a long time back when it all happened. Or even worse, the, some of the people who offended me died or went crazy. They lost their sanity or they lost their lives. And I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but I've seen it again and again. One must be very cautious not to offend an advanced transcendentalist. Then he goes on that he heard them describe the attractive activities of Krishna. Krishna is supposed to be an incarnation or avatar of Vishnu. And Krishna means pleasurable activities. It's a literal translation of the word roots in the name Krishna. And we see, actually, especially in his pastimes as a youth in the forests of Vrindavan, very attractive pastimes of love. So, in those pastimes, he is considered the transcendental Cupid, or the incarnation of love personified. And that's a deep topic. We could go uh, far into it. And we have in some of our descriptions of Rasa Tattva in other series. But for now, the important point is that Narada after taking their remnants and clearing his mind and heart of all vicious desires and sinful activities, heard from them their devotional recitations of the pastimes of their Ishta Devata, Krishna. And finally, as a result, he developed a passionate longing for God. That means love, bhakti. And as a result of that, bhakti, the uh, glory of love, 
arose in him, and he developed unshakable conviction in the truth that this whole illusory universe, which both exists and does not exist at the same time, was simply a creation of his own illusory powers, and that he himself is actually the unconditioned Brahman. Now, of course, this is the actual conclusion of Vedanta. Uh, but uh, Prabhupada, in his translation, he translates Brahma as Krishna. But it's stated right here clearly in the text, Pashya Mai Brahmani Kalpitam Pare, that uh, he realized himself to be Brahman. So, of course, this is the actual conclusion of Vedanta. This is the actual conclusion of all the great souls, especially Sripad Shankaracharya, who wrote the most wonderful commentary on the Vedanta, revealing its real meaning very clearly. So Ramana Maharshi and so many other great beings, realized souls, follow this same conclusion and teach it in a variety of different ways, uh, both saguna with qualities and nirguna without qualities. So this is how Narada became the great sage, the son of Lord Brahma, that simply by hearing and following these devotional principles in his previous life, in the next life, he became the son of the creator of the universe, Brahma, and had all mystical powers, including the ability to travel anywhere simply by vibrating mantras. And so this is a great secret, which he revealed to Vyasadeva, the editor or compiler of the Vedas, in his uh, quest to understand the greatest of all knowledge. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.